In this presentation, we will take a look at a comparison between the allowance method and the direct write-off method. When considering both the allowance method and direct write-off method, we are considering the accounts receivable account. Remember that the accounts receivable account represents money that is owed to the company, typically from sales made in the past on account, haven't yet received the funds for sales made in the past and therefore the company is owed money. We see this amount on the trial balance, in this case 1,191. We then want to know uh, information about that, including who owes us that money. We can't find that typically in the GL, as we have a GL for every account. The GL only given us the information by date. Typically, we want to see that information also broken out in the subsidiary ledger, saying who owes us this money. A problem that we have is that the accounts receivable represents funds we have not yet received and may not receive if there is some problem with some customers, we might not get the funds. The question then is, should we be writing off this amount at the point in time that we believe we're not going to be able to receive it? Should we be estimating how much we think is not going to be collectible or waiting until the end of the time period until we determine that something will be uncollectible? The generally accepted accounting principle, the principle that we should typically be using if under GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, would be an allowance method, meaning that we would be writing off or matching up with the accounts receivable and allowance accounts that would be an estimate showing us what we think or believe based on past experience will be uncollectible on the balance sheet. And that would write down the accounts receivable and not overstate the accounts receivable. And we would also be writing off the bad debt expense then at the point in time to match it up with the revenue at the same point in time. The other method is going to be the direct write-off method, which typically is not a generally accepted accounting principles method unless the amount of uh, the uncollectible receivables is substantially small and therefore not material to decision making. Otherwise, if we're, if we're a smaller company and we, we're not publicly traded, we may not have to be uh, regulated under the same type of rules and may not be restricted to the method we use and therefore we need to make a decision. Do we want to use one method or the other? The direct write-off method has the benefit of typically being easier to use because we can just wait. There's no estimate happening. We can wait until we believe something is not going to be collectible and then write it off. Uh, note that that does distort the income statement in some ways because uh, we're writing it off at a later time period and therefore not matching it up with the revenue earned in that time period. It also gives us an ability to distort net income in some ways because we can make a decision at the end of the time period to write it off or not. Maybe we wait until the next year or not. Whereas if we use an allowance method, an estimating method, then we have to make some type of reasonable estimate. Uh, so those are going to be the pros and cons between the, the two methods. We'll go through and look at them both. So here's going to be the direct write-off method where we are going to say that this customer is not going to pay us $9,000. we have determined it at this point in time and therefore we're going to debit bad debt expense and credit the receivable at this point in time. The difference here being the bad debt expense which brings down net income at the uh, time when uh, we determine it's uncollectible. If we post this to the general ledger, we're going to say that bad debt is going to go up from zero up to 9,000 by this debit. That 9,000 then represented here on the trial balance. The accounts receivable is going to go down because they don't owe us any more money or we've given up on it. The receivable is going to be credited. Here's the GL account, 1,200,000 going down by the 9,000 to 1,191,000 that then being represented on the trial balance as well. We can see that on the trial balance that we have the, re the revenue is now going down by the bad debt, the net income then being decreased at the point in time we determine that the bad debt would be uncollectible. We also want to see the, the uh, information that would back up the accounts receivable that would be on the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. Here's the CW company owing us 9000 we're writing that off, bringing the balance down uh, down to zero after that point in time after we write this off. So now it's down to zero. That would be owed to a certain. Remember that the subsidiary ledger would include all uh, people that owe us money 
all companies and people that owe us money. And if we added them up, it would tie out to what is on the trial balance as well as what is on the general ledger. If we contrast that to the allowance method, we have the similar journal entry decreasing the receivable here, but the other side not to go into bad debt, but instead go into the allowance account. So now we have the same accounts receivable result. It's starting at 1,200,000 going down by 9,000 to 1,191,000. However, now we're using this allowance account, which we weren't using before. We just had it as a demonstration. And we had already estimated that there's 40,000 that was made in the prior period, the prior year, or the prior month uh, that we wrote off in the prior period to match it up to the revenue in that period. And we created this allowance account. And now we're just gonna write down that allowance account. No effect down here to bad debt at this point in time. No effect to net income at this point in time. We, at the end of the period, will make an estimate based on the revenue and or the accounts receivable to determine how much of this revenue we think is gonna be uncollectible and therefore be matching up with the matching principle. So in this case, when we write it off, there's no effect on the net income accounts. It's just affecting this allowance account, which we had set up prior. And we still have the decrease uh, from the 9,000 down by the 9,200 in the accounts receivable. Same activity in the trial balance, I mean the general ledger, in terms of accounts receivable, back to that 1,191,000, 1,191,000. If we take a look at a side-by-side -side comparison, here's the uh, bad debt, uh, the direct write-off, and here's the allowance method. So here we're not using the allowance account under the direct write-off method. It's just there to show uh, what account would be used under the allowance method. It's not being here used under this side, the direct write-off. It is being used over here. We can see that we have the 1,191,000, Nothing in the allowance, it's not, it's not a relevant account under the direct write-off method. Over here, we still have the 1,191, but we have this 31,000, which was there prior, was created prior to this time period uh, when we wrote off the bad debt related to the prior time period. So this 31 is still left over that we think could be uncollectible or become uncollectible at some point in the future based on an estimate. On the income statement side, we decreased net income by that 9,000. So the 378,000 minus this 9,000 is the 369. On the allowance method, no write off to bad debt at this point in time. We won't write it off until we make an estimate at the end of the time period based on either revenue or our accounts receivable. Next transaction, G Company payment 20,000 of 30. This is gonna be the direct write-off, half of this, so we're looking at the direct write-off. We're gonna say that we did get cash, so we debit the cash, it's increasing. Then the accounts receivable is going off the books for the 30,000, the entire amount owed. We're not gonna get the added 10,000. The difference then is gonna be the 10,000. We have to put it somewhere. This will be the difference between the two methods. Under the direct write-off method, we'll write it off to the bad debt expense. Under the allowance method, as we will see in the next slide, it would be going to the allowance for doubtful accounts. If we record this then, cash is gonna go up 10, 100,000 plus the 20,000 to 120. We can see the accounts receivable is gonna go uh, down. We were at 1,191,000, down by the 30,000 to 1,161,000. This matching up with what's on the trial balance now, the 1,161,000 and the 120,000. And then we have the bad debt which is going to go from the 9,000 up by 10,000 to 19,000. That, of course, over here on the trial balance as well. Note that we are increasing bad debt expense at this point in time, that being the difference, that then affecting net income, net income going down. We also want to remember that we will be recording something to the subsidiary ledger. This company, this particular company, owes us 30,000. We're going to decrease it down by 30 to zero meaning they're not going to owe us anything anymore even though they only paid us 20 we're not going to leave the 10 there that they still owe us we gave up on it and therefore are going to write the entire thing out down to zero contrasting that with the allowance method we still got the cash we still got the receivables going down to zero but instead of the 10,000 going to bad debt now it goes to the allowance for doubtful accounts so we have the same effect on the accounts receivable 
1,191,000 down by the 30,000 to 1 million 161. Same effect on the allowance uh, for, I'm sorry, same effect on the subsidiary ledger, uh, the company going down to zero in terms of the subsidiary ledger, 30,000 minus the 30,000 to zero. The difference being that there's no impact on the income statement, bad debt not being affected, no effect on net income. What is happening is we have this allowance account which was at 31 prior to this, now going down by that 30,000 to the 21. Remember that this 31 was there prior to this time period. It was there created from the prior time period based on an estimate and we created the bad debt expense based on either the revenue or the accounts receivable and then we closed it out of course that's why there's nothing in bad debt expense because it got closed out at the end of the year or the end of the month and therefore is at zero and we're writing off the uncollectible receivables here that has already hit the income statement in our estimate we estimated it prior to this wrote it off in the prior time period it then rolled into the capital account in the closing process and therefore is not on the income statement for this time period and we're just writing off the bad debt to the allowance account we will have a bad debt won't happen however until we make an estimate at the end of the time period if we compare and contrast the two then this is the bad debt this is the allowance method this is this is the direct write-off method this is the allowance method we have no allowance for doubtful accounts. It's just there for demonstration. We're not using it under the direct write-off method. We have 19,000 of people that we have determined will not be collectible and therefore wrote them off, decreasing net income by that 19, that 378 minus the 19, bringing net income to net income of 359,000. We have the same receivable over here, but then we have the allowance account. It's now going down to 21,000 because that's where we wrote off the people that we have determined that would be uncollectible. No effect on bad debt expense, no effect on the income statement from writing off these accounts thus far. Next one, we're gonna say receive payment from CW after writing it off. So this is that unusual one. It doesn't happen all that often in real life. We're gonna first take a look at the direct write-off method. This is a really good example problem though because it allows us to see the difference between the two methods and what would happen if we, if we had to reverse a, a write-off. And so it makes us think kind of backwards, which is great for testing and, and our knowledge on this type of stuff. So we wrote CW off. We said, hey, they're not gonna pay us the 9,000. And then they came in even without our collection actions. We gave up collecting the money. They came in and paid us and that's great. So you would think that we would debit cash and credit some other account. We couldn't credit accounts receivable because we already wrote it off. We wrote it off, in this case, under the direct write-off method to bad debt. So you would think we can just debit cash and credit bad debt. But if we did so, we wouldn't have it run through the receivable account. And if we looked at the, at the receivable subsidiary ledger, it looks like this 9,000 is due to them not paying us and we want to show that they did pay us and therefore under either method we do need to reverse what we did prior to give us a paper trail that this client is good so therefore we're going to reverse what we did last time under the direct write-off method we uh, credited accounts receivable and we debited bad debt we're going to reverse that we're going to put them back on the books increasing the accounts receivable by the nine thousand decreasing bad debt. Unusual account here, bad debt and expense typically only going up with debits. This is an exception to the rule. We are reversing it under the direct write-off method. This being the difference between the allowance and direct write-off under the allowance method, this would be the allowance for doubtful accounts account. Once we do that, then we can just do our normal transaction that would happen if a company came in and paid us on account. Debiting the checking account, increasing the checking account, crediting accounts receivable, decreasing accounts receivable. Note between these two journal entries, here's accounts receivable, here's accounts receivable, debit, credit, doing the same thing. If we eliminate those two, we're left with a debit to the checking account, credit to bad debt. So we could shorten this from just a technical standpoint to just this with one journal entry, but that doesn't give us a good paper trail, therefore we don't do that. So if we post this, then we're going to say accounts receivable is going to go back up by the 9,000 to this, 
And then we're gonna say that the bad debt is gonna go down. Here's the 9,000 here. We're now eliminating it. And that brings us to the 10,000 down from 19. And then we have the cash account, which is gonna go from uh, 120 up by the 9,000 to uh, 129,000. And then we're gonna have the second component, which is gonna be this item here. The accounts receivable going down, bringing the 1,170 down by 9,000 to 1,161. That's where we're at now on the accounts receivable on the trial balance. And then we got the subsidiary account, and that's went from zero. It's gonna go up by 9,000 to 9,000. And then we're taking it back down again, down by 9,000 to zero. So the accounts receivable subsidiary account went from uh, 9,000 credit back to zero. Then we debited it by this 9,000 here, bringing it back up to 9,000, and then we credited it by 9,000. This looks really repetitive because it just, this is where we started, and then it went up, and then it went back down. But this gives us a paper trail. This item, if we were to drill down on it, would show that we got paid here. Whereas this item, if we drill down on it, would show that we gave up on the customer. So that's the important difference between reversing this rather than just recording a debit to cash, credit to bad debt expense. If we look at the allowance method, same type of activity. We're going to reverse what we did, and then we're going to record the normal transaction. The only difference here being this item. When we first recorded the write-off, we debited the um, we debited the allowance for doubtful accounts and credited the receivable. Now we're just reversing that. So we debit uh, accounts receivable just as we did under the direct write-off, but instead of crediting the bad debt, now crediting the allowance. Just reversing it. Then we're back in good standing and we can do the same thing that we did in the direct write-off method or the same thing we would always do when we receive cash on account, debiting cash and increasing cash and decreasing with a credit accounts receivable. So note here, no effect on the net income. The allowance account then is going to go back up from 21 up by the 9 to the 30,000 and that's because of course this individual uh, did pay us so we're not taking it taking that down the accounts receivable account on the general ledger went back up and then went back down so we can see it just went up down same thing we put it back in and took it back out if we look at the CW account here this is where we started same thing his subsidiary ledger account for this customer goes back up by 9 and back down Everything is the same except for this allowance account being the reversing account we're using, not affecting the bad debt expense. And the way to think of this is just to think about what did we do before and reverse it. If we look at the comparison, here's the direct write-off, here's the allowance method. Direct write-off, I'm showing the allowance account here, but it's not used. It's not being used here, it's just, that's why it's red, it's, not gonna, it's just a placeholder. And what we did was uh, change the bad debt expense to write off or reverse what happened and then record our normal increase in the checking account and receivables. Under the allowance method, we have the same thing except no effect on bad debt. The adjustment that happened happened here in the allowance method, increasing that allowance back up. We will have the bad debt at the end of the time period when we make an adjustment under the allowance method. These will be the major differences when recording the normal transactions uh, for a, an individual or customer that is determined to be uncollectible and when they pay us after we wrote them off. Going forward, the allowance method will then have an adjustment in order to record the allowance for doubtful account based on either the revenue method here in terms of how much revenue was earned taking a percentage of that to determine what the bad debt would be matched up against that revenue. Or use a balance sheet method, taking a look at the accounts receivable and determining how much of the receivable is gonna be uncollectible. Either way, it's better in terms of the matching method. So the next step on the allowance method would be to determine in some way what the bad debt expense is, not in the case, not by knowing or finding out who is not gonna pay us this time period uh, from sales made in the past, but instead making some type of estimate in terms of 
of this revenue made this time period, how much of it will not be paid, thereby matching up the expense to the related income in the same time period. That estimate, once again, could be made either by looking at revenue, taking some kind of percentage or some type of estimate based on the revenue earned this time period, this month, this year, or look at, at the balance sheet account and seeing how much of this we believe is gonna be uncollectible. That then getting to the same number of bad debt, but doing it in kind of a reversed type of way. Whatever we discern, decide is uncollectible, whatever we have to adjust this allowance account to be, the difference will be the bad debt expense here that will be matching up revenue and expenses.